Four years ago, Carl Perry was a taxi driver, a greyhound enthusiast with a dream of training greyhounds. When he picked up one particular customer, both of their lives changed forever. I went to work at Sheffield from leaving school, and but before that, I had you know regular good dog racing, with an uncles what had dogs, and they had a lot of dogs at Sheffield at the time, so it was really down to them, the, you know, that got me into involved with grounds. And then when I left school, I started working at Sheffield as a track lad, and then a through different jobs, ended up in ground staff and paddock steward and a few little other bits before leaving about four years later. And who would have thought that all that could end up uh, how it is today? You were actually driving a taxi when uh, you were driving a, a client that meant basically your life would change forever. Tell us how your relationship with Nick Brereton started. Yeah, that was that was the time I met Nick. Yeah, uh, we used to you know we did an airport transfer business in Sheffield, and uh, Nick was a regular client, uh, and I took him on a few occasions. But the one occasions we got talking, you know, what he'd been up to and. He'd tell me about his interest in these dogs that he currently had running at Sheffield, and we spent the next three-hour conversation, uh, you know, learning a lot more about his dogs than he already knew. Uh, and that was I you driving him, him yeah. from Sheffield dog track to Heathrow Airport. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was a Tuesday night. Yeah, late Tuesday night, and uh, you yeah, spent three hours talking about his dogs, and uh, he said to me after he learnt more off me than he did or didn't know about his dogs. How on earth did you go from that conversation to what I've seen here today? Uh, just you know, Nick had a desire that he, one day that he always wanted to do his own thing, and um, he always said that he was waiting for the right person to find to do it with, and we hit it off straight away. We had the same ideas and we had the same, you know, we, we the same passion, and you know, we just clicked yeah, together. And in that, we come up with the idea of starting his own and doing his own, and he put faith in me, and I put a lot of faith in him as well. And uh, you know, so far, so good. You've both been lucky in the sense that both of your families were very supportive and it's ended up being a life that certainly your family really enjoy and I'm guessing it's the same for him. Yeah, I mean, you know, Nick's involvement with the grounds, he was very family orientated, he had dogs at Sheffield, you know, with, for the two kids, George and Laura, they used to love going to see the dogs and his wife Becky supported Nick, you know, because she knew that was his passion and the same as, you know, the opportunity coming for us, uh, my wife and kids, you know, they all bought into it as well and... Uh, it was a big change in life for us, but you know, something I definitely wouldn't regret doing and definitely uh, enjoying every minute of it. And it's an ideal way for you to train as well, isn't it? As sort of a, a private trainer for somebody, because we've talked about several things today where you said you, you don't have to do things like normal trainers might have to because of the way that things run here. Yeah, we have, you know, we have one person to keep happy and, you know, that's Nick. And, and to be fair to Nick, he, he kind of leaves us to it and, you know, goes along with what we're doing. You know, we agree things together. Uh, you know, other trainers have different situations where they have a lot of owners to keep happy, happy and sometimes, you know, that can be difficult. And, you know, I've seen that on many occasions for other trainers having to suffer that. So there's perhaps a little bit less pressure on you, but you're also allowed to do things in a way that you believe is right, uh, which is what in terms of training a greyhound? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we try and think, you know, that the dogs need best of everything and, and, and we're given the best of everything we can and um, every opportunity to... To, to, to do as well as they can um, you know that includes feeding you know the daily routine you know you know checking for injuries we have a regular physio Daryl Hopper comes and sees every two weeks you know he's a big essential part of the team with the amount of dogs we have you know which having his expertise you know point at niggling injuries that we can work on and maintain it helps hopefully keep down the bit in the major injuries. You have plenty of staff here and, and the dogs seem very well handled yeah, I mean, it's a big operation now. I mean, we've doubled as operation in the last few months to, you know, nearly 70 dogs. And for that, you know, you need you need the staff, you know. We're in a very lucky position. We've got great staff. We have 10 members of staff. Uh, and we have four or five on a daily basis. You know, we do a lot of racing. So we need plenty of cover, you know, back at the kennels when we are racing. But no, I mean, we can't do what we do without the staff. You mentioned the food and uh, you showed me it today pretty much, well, basically is human consumption food. Yeah, yeah, you know, we, we feed beef, we feed chicken, you know, and pasta, plenty of veg and uh, nothing, you know, that, that it's, you know, it's all good stuff for the dogs and, you know, we, we feed twice a day, we feed breakfast and dinner, you know, we cook up every day and, you know, we, we, we soak the biscuit with the gravy and just, you know, it's good stuff, just good food. And then an extra little treat of bedtime. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, Michelle and the kids have the dogs out at night and, yeah, they, they get plenty of treats, um, you know, that, uh, you know, it's, that's nice as well because they expect it there. All the kennels 
very spacious, nice big bedding, and they're all beautifully heated as well, which I can testify to. It's cold day today, but they're all lovely and warm. Yeah, I mean, that's something we try and do. I mean, uh, we learned, you know, from the first winter what we had here that, you know, leaving coats on the dogs a lot, you know, it's not very comfortable for dogs to be left with coats in the kennels. And, you know, we started to get dogs that were getting rub marks on the sh shoulders and... and you know, we, we, so we, we rather invested in, you know, having an eating system where we keep it constantly warm all the time. Uh, I don't know if it does as good in the long run because a lot of our dogs don't like the winter weather when we have to take them racing. Uh, but, but, you know, that's, that's how they kept. It's, it's, you know, we're trying to do the best we can for them. And the radio on as well for a bit of company? Yeah, yeah, that's something that essentially in every block, obviously. Um, we find that it keeps them a lot quieter at night. And obviously we live next door to the kennel and... Um, very rare we'll hear any noises through the night and obviously, it, you know, the radio's a great, you know, side effect for them. All your black dogs look so shiny, their coats are incredible and, and there's no exception to that. How do you do you get your dogs looking like that? I think, you know, it's, it's a combination of a good diet and, and you know, regular grooming and, and regular hands-on work from, from the staff. Um, you know, we, we, we do pride ourselves on the dogs looking well. You know, we try the best always, for the, you know, for the dogs to look well. Um, Obviously, during the winter months, it's not always easy with the weather and the cold weather, but, you know, as you're having to use coats. But, yeah, we do take a lot of pride in the dogs looking well. And if you do get one that maybe you can't get a shiny that comes in a bit scruffy, what do you do with it? We find out the way that we, we, we do, get, you know, we try as artists with it, you know, bathing or special treatment, what they need, you know, we find a way to, you know, to get the condition right. Um, you do, you will find the odd dog that you can try everything and, you know, they just won't condition. But I, I think there's, you know, there's a way for every dog if you find a way. You were saying that four years ago when you and Nick started here, you had a five-year plan. What happened to that? And that disappeared after about two and a half years. Uh, we, we accelerated rather quicker than we should have done. Uh, you know, we had plans to, to build up nice and slowly and then move into the breeding side, but we had such a great, successful first year that it's all escalated and before we know it, we were probably, you know, a good few years ahead of where we should have been. Could you go back to driving a taxi now? No, not not with not full choice, not full choice. No, um, you know we we chose a lifestyle here. You know a job that you know I'd always wanted to do, or I'd had a passion to do, but obviously never thought I'd get the opportunity. So now we have got the opportunity. We'll we'll make the most of it.